Amen. Amen. Thank you, Emma. Welcome. Good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah, as I walked back to come around the, the side, I saw that we had people standing, so I just want to make sure that everyone's got a seat. We don't need to put out more chairs, but what a great problem to have. Um, you know, it's, it's really exciting to see you guys and to see this church just continuing to grow. Uh, before I get started this morning, I'm pretty sure that I put on someone else's mask, and it was a lady, and so I have a lot of perfume right now. That's, that's how I know that it was not my mask. <laughs> So, but anyway, yeah, I'm excited to, to do this series uh, because community is something that we feel really strong about here at church. And in fact, you guys hear me say this every week, but if this is your first week, I just want you to know that I realize that there is almost nothing out there that you would give an hour, hour and 10 minutes of your time to for, for us to speak into. Like, like, my son will only sit down and give YouTube 20 seconds before he's off to another video. You know, we, we're in a society and a culture where we're so busy that we rarely sit down and give somebody or give something like a solid hour of our time. And so when you come in here on a Sunday morning and you give us time, I feel like I want to honor you and respect you and I want to give back something that's going to make your day better or make your week better or maybe just help life out a little bit. So everything that I say today is coming from that heart. I just want to sow something back into you that just makes your week better. So if you're new here, just know that that's our heart. We're so thankful that you're here. We're so thankful that you just give us an opportunity to try and make your, your life better. So we're finishing this series today, Better Together. But I want to start, before we start talking about community, I first want to talk about our names. So in our names, there's so much value that comes in our name. There's so much value associated with a name. So when we got ready to have our first born, Casey and I were talking about names. And, you know, what did we like? What did we not like? And, and we really settled on Benjamin. We liked Benjamin. And what Benjamin means is it means the, the one to the right, the right hand of God or the, the son to the right. And the person that sat on the right was always in a position of honor. It was like for the first born or, or it was for... Uh, just that person of honor. And we felt like Benjamin would, would represent that. That God gave us that name for Benjamin. And so we named him Benjamin and we spoke that over him. And then additionally, Benjamin's middle name is Lee. So his full name is Benjamin Lee Ladd. His nickname is Jam, which means a whole lot. But his nickname is Jam, but his middle name is Lee. My middle name is Lee. My dad's middle name is Lee. So there's so much power, there's so much uh, like, like meaning that comes from that middle name Lee. It doesn't just represent Benjamin, it represents multi, multiple generations. Now, our second son that's about to be born, probably on Easter morning, so we're, we're starting to look for people to lead a Sunday service on that day. But his name, because he's not the firstborn, we don't care about him as much. He doesn't get the middle name Lee. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, hey, parents, you know, everybody in here knows. The firstborn's like, oh, you know, and the secondborn, and if you have three and four, like, they start raising themselves, but, so we came up with the name Wyatt. So we, yeah, Wyatt, a lot of people say Wyatt, Wyatt Earp, but, but Wyatt, the meaning of Wyatt is, is son of strength. It, it has to do with strength, and we felt that for, for Wyatt. Now, Wyatt's middle name is not Lee, but it take, he took my name, Christopher. So his name is Wyatt Christopher Ladd. So to me, that's, that's very touching, and that's very inspirational. See, we, we have so much value that comes in our names, what you're named, what your name means. But the other question that I would have you think is, what is associated when someone says your name? So when someone says... Chris Ladd or Pastor Chris, it brings up different associations for different people. I hope for most people it brings up something good, but I know that that's not the case for all. So when someone thinks about your name, when someone hears your name, when someone hears Will or when someone hears Alan or, or Casey or Ruth or whoever it is, what do they think when they hear your name? And then I would ask, are you happy with what they would think when they hear your name? when they hear your name. Do you like that? Do you like what you're associated with? Do you like what, what your name represents? 
See, I want to put you in this frame set, and th- this whole sermon today is going to be about this. We're going to be g- sort of guiding each other through this mindset. We're going to be guiding through this idea of thinking about things that, that actually matter. And we're doing marriage counseling with a couple couples right now, and we're asking them these amazing questions. We're, one of the first questions we ask them is, what's your most important value? What's the thing that you value the most? And both sets of couples have said, I don't know. I've never thought about that. Now, they do have values, but they've just never thought about it to put words to it. So there is something associated with your name. There is something that you hope is associated with your name, but maybe you haven't thought about it. Maybe you haven't put words to it. Because I I would think that the majority of us would say, I hope that when someone says my name, when someone says the name of Randall, they think about a great man of God that invites everyone in his community to come to South Point Church. That, that they would see a great father there. I, I hope that when they hear the name of Casey, that I know that Casey wants people to see her as a good mother. Casey wants people to see her as kind and compassionate. I know that when David has people hear his name, David's back in the corner. He's a, he, he's a trainer. But David is, is the most faithful person I've ever met. And I know that it's his desire that when his name is heard, that people say, I want people to associate me with being faithful, with being steadfast. So what is it that we want associated with our names? See, we don't take time to think about these things. And that's the problem, is we just scoot through life without actually thinking about and naming and proclaiming the things that we want our name to represent. So if we had the choice... I, I don't know anyone that would associate a negative value to this. I don't know that anyone would say, well, I want to be known for beating people up. Or, I, you know, I thought about a lot of negative things and I decided I don't want to say any of them because I don't want to speak that over any of you in here. But we, we want something positive here. But there's something that typically stops us from that. So what is it that's stopping you from being who you want to be? What stops you from becoming the person that you want to be known for? See, we don't start out in life as there's a moment in your life, and I see it in Benjamin right now. He's almost three years old, and there's joy, and there's innocence, and there's a lack of worry and a lack of concern. And so if we go far enough back in life, we find a place in our childhood where we're filled with joy, we're filled with compassion, we're filled with innocence. But then somewhere along the line, life happens and life keeps happening over and over and over and over again. And we drift from that. We lose our innocence. We lose the things that make us joyful. We lose the things that we hope that our name would associate with. We, I want to be a good dad, but there are things in my life that have happened that have caused seasons maybe where I wasn't the best dad that I could be. And so of the things that you think, what do I want associated with my name? What's stopping you from being who you want to be? Well, it's life. And it's life because life is hard. Life is very hard. Life is something that, that just happens to us. It's It's difficult. You know, there's hard days, there's good days, there's bad days. But when life comes at you, life happens in, in the form of a flat tire. Life happens in a form of, of, of the dishwasher breaking. Life happens when you get fired. Life happens when you spend uh, an hour and a half in traffic every single week. That, that's when life happens to you. And it's all these little things that start to chip away at you. They chip away, and they chip away, and they chip away... And, and it starts to change the way we think of ourselves, and it starts to, to take us away from the idea of what do I want my name to represent? You know, there's bigger things in life that happen. There's, there's, there's death, there's cancer, there's, there's losing a job, there's, there's these major moments that happen in life, these tragedies that happen in life, and those often really change us. They completely change our trajectory. But we don't want to stay there. And I'm going to help us to not stay there today. And so, I want to read a statement for you here. And it's this, your character and your identity are the summation of of the experiences you have encountered and how you have dealt with those experiences. I'll say that again. Your character and your identity, they are the summation of the experiences you have encountered and how you have dealt with those experiences. Who you are today as you sit here is is a product of what's happened in your environment. 
It may be because of where you were born. It may be the racial class you were born in. It may be the social class that you were born in. It, it may be which side of the city you were born on. It may be, I mean, I wake up and I, I think, man, I am the definition of privilege. I was born in America with two loving parents, two loving uh, parents that love me very much. I had a good family, a healthy family, and it positioned me with an enormous amount of privilege that so many other people that I meet, they don't have that. But it's, it's my character and my identity come from the, the, the summation of all my experiences, which means that I can't have the character or the identity that some of you have. Because some of you have been given more opportunities to overcome, more opportunities to push through trials more opportunities to be, to be even like hurt and to go through really hard stuff. See, the more that comes at you, the more life you deal with, the more your character and your identity is shaped. Now, your character and your identity is going to be shaped whether you think about it or not. That's the thing that, that gets me is it's always happening. Whether you know it or you don't know it, it's always, always, always happening. It just may not be positive, or you may not be aware of it, but your character, your identity is constantly being shaped for you. And so I want to ask you a question. The question that I would ask you is, are you okay? When you think about who you are, when you think about your name, when you think about what your name represents, when you think about life, think about what, what, what is life thrown at you this week? What is life thrown at you this month? What's, what's life thrown at you in the last year or the last two years? I mean, we've been dealing with COVID now for, for two years. What, what, what is life thrown at you? And is, is everything okay? How long has it been since you paused and someone asked you, is everything okay? Now, in our house, I ask my wife this question all the time. I, I, I feed off of her, off of her energy and off of her state of mind or how she carries herself. And I, I will say, hey, are you okay? Is everything okay? But I do it like constantly because I don't like the idea of her not being okay. It offsets the balance in the house. And I'll say, hey, are you okay? Is everything okay? Now, she hates me asking that question because it makes her feel frozen, right? Makes it, she, so she's like, don't ask me that question. That, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about, you know, annoying your spouse. What I'm talking about is, is a deep look into your life and asking yourself the question, is everything actually okay? And you know what? I want to give you permission for everything to not be okay today. Now, the second question I ask you is this, are you happy? Are you happy? This is a hard question to answer. Am I okay? Am I happy? Now, happy is not the goal for life. Ha happy, we don't, it's, I'm not talking about us walking around and always laughing and always smiling. Those people are manic. They're on medication for that. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is are you content? Is there something, are, is there a, a, a contentness in you? See, you can be happy. You can be joyful. Even when things aren't going well. Even when things, things are not going your way, when life is really coming at you, you can be okay. You can be happy. You know, I often, at night, I like to sort of unload kind of my mind, and so Casey likes to go to bed really early. She likes to get in bed at like nine o'clock, because we get up pretty early, and then oftentimes I'll come in like nine, nine thirty, because we try and go to bed at the same time every night, and then I do this thing where I just completely like unload my entire day, kind of just on her. Now, I don't want to talk throughout the day, but for some reason at that moment in the night, it's a good time for me to tell her everything. And then I lay down and go to sleep, and she sits up all night and thinks about everything that I said. <laughs> so, but the other night, I was telling her, you know, I've got this going on, we've got this going on, there's this challenge, there's that challenge, I'm, we're working with these things, and, and maybe I'm feeling like a little bit down, but I said, I said, I'm, I'm feeling all these things, but just so you know, I'm happy. Everything's okay. I, I'm happy and everything's okay. So a, as you think about those two questions, I just want you to be okay with things not being okay. I want you to be okay with things not being happy, but I, I want to give us a pathway 
for how to come out of this, for how to find out how do we deal with being okay and how do we deal with life maybe when we're not content, maybe when we struggle with, do I have joy? Is there hope in my life? Now, what's the best way to do that? The best way that I know that we can do that, and I know this because of the way that we were created, is we do that with help. So we get help, and help is the thing that helps us in our life. Help is the thing that we need, that, that we're desperate for. See, Casey and I, we, when we moved to Cape Town, we started, we came to Cape Town, and we were going to start our own church. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But we thought, hey, we're going to go to Cape Town, we're going to start our own church, and we, for like three years, we just failed miserably over and over and over again. We just could not get anything up and running, could not get anything going. In fact, the only thing that we did get going and we did get up and running is another family, David and Deirdre, and they followed us here to South Point, and they're, they're here now. But for three years, we spent a lot of time feeling like we were just completely alone. And life, life was hard. Life's really hard when you're alone. You know, we were dealing with visa issues with, with Casey. Home Affairs gave her a, a real visa that turned fake. And so we had to take Home Affairs to court. And no one could really understand that or identify with that. We, we were dealing with, with being not from Cape Town, but trying to live in Cape Town. We put our son in Weinberg, and that was a disaster because apparently there's a certain kind of person that goes to Weinberg, and then apparently there's a certain kind of person that goes to Saks, and then there's a certain person that goes to any of the Pineland schools, and we didn't know that. We just thought people went to school where they lived. And in fact, we ended up breaking a lease in our first year living in Cape Town, and I told our realtor, I said, I think we've made a mistake. I think we've moved to the wrong area and we're in the wrong school system. And her response was, you did make a mistake and I understand because you don't understand Cape Town and she let us out of our lease. It was very kind of her, but that's a real thing. So we had a long, lonely, lonely season. And I believe that that long, lonely season that Casey and I went through, we went through it and, and God took that season and He created in us an absolute passion. He created in us a desire that no one would do life alone. We had too many lonely nights that we want to make it impossible for you to be alone here in Cape Town. So when I think about this idea of help, when I look out into the audience here and I see all of you sitting there, you know what I see? I see potential to change the life of the person next to you. I see that in every person is, is perfectly encapsulated this beautifully made, wonderfully formed personality and set of gifts and set of talents. And you can take those things that, that are you, those things that make you you, those things that feed your soul. And you take those things and you go share those with somebody else or you be who you are and you do it next to somebody else. And then all of a sudden you have this thing that, that I like to consider being called life in community. And now you're doing life in community with others. And see, when we do life in community, we don't do life alone. We don't have to be alone. We can take everything that we have to somebody else and get help. There's, there's a young lady here in the church, and um, her name is Davida. And Davida volunteers with us, and, and she's volunteered with us for a long time, and she, she's not in here. I think she's in Upstreet, but she doesn't know that she's the sermon illustration today, so she can keep it a secret. But Davida came to me a couple of weeks ago, and she said that she had read a book, or she saw something. I was half listening, but, but something had inspired her, and she said the word community, and then I really started to listen and what Davida's done is she just went out on a limb and started inviting people to come to her home. I think she's got an 80-year-old mixed with young adults, mixed with all kinds of different people that are coming to her home one night a week, and they're spending time together. That's community. That's living life in community. That's being not afraid to extend the invitation. See, to live life in community, you've got to live together. But you know what's scary about this? You know why we don't do this? We don't do this because we don't want someone to see how messy our life is. We don't want someone to see the, the, the brokenness that, that makes us us. You know, we're really good at hiding the things in us that we don't want other people to see. We're really good at putting on a front. 
really good at, you know, hey, Pastor Chris, how you doing? Oh, everything's great. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Like, hey, just, just trucking right along. You know, Monday's coming around the corner. How's the weather? You know, those are the things that, that we put up because we don't want to let someone in. See, what I learned to do in that three-year sort of season for Casey and I is I learned to just lead hard and heavy and lean hard and heavy into honesty and into openness. And I thought, you know what? This whole thing where I just protect everything that's in me so that no one can see my mess, it just doesn't work. And so I'm going to go the other way. And I actually started living by this principle here that I want to read you. And it, it's this. In order to participate in the beauty of life with others, we have to be okay with showing people the messes in our own lives. So in order to participate in the beauty of life with others, we have to be okay with showing people the messes in our own lives. Can, can we do that? You can nod your head and you can say yes, and you can raise your hand and say absolutely. But this is pretty hard because our lives are messy. Behind these doors here, behind the doors of your home, behind the doors of your car, behind the doors of your thoughts or your heart or your emotions, hey, those of us that have great emotional walls, those of us that don't grieve or that don't let people in, behind those doors is a mess. It's an absolute mess. We're all a mess because we all are sinners. We all live this messy life. That's what makes us so great for each other. Because if we just recognize that, hey, your mess may not look like mine, but you're a total mess, just like I'm a total mess. So you know what? I'm going to drop the wall. And I'm going to instead say, you know what? I want to participate in the beauty that is life with others more than I want to hide or guard the mess that's in my life. See, there is beauty when we do life with other people. There's something that, that's just, it's, it's a relief. It's like letting air out of a tire. It's, it's like, ah, when you open yourself up and then someone else opens themselves up and you realize, actually, we can do this together and this is actually a beautiful thing. So I have a question for you. We, we've gone through this journey of, of what's your name? What's your name mean? What do you hope your name means? We talked about life and how difficult life can be. We talked about being messy in our lives. We talked about how, how there's beauty in doing life together. We've talked about how much potential is in every single one of you to just bring light and love and joy in Jesus to those around you, no matter how messy you are. But you have to make a decision, and the choice is yours to make. So do you choose community, or do you choose to do life alone? See, I've put it on the screen here because I want you to read it and I want you to see it. The choice is yours to make. Do you choose life in community or do you choose life alone? Because we kind of have to make that decision. At some point, you've got to make this decision. Now, the sad thing is, is that there are some people that go their whole life and they say, I, I would rather keep my walls up and I would rather do life alone. But my job, because I know the potential in each and every one of you, is to try and get you to understand that doing life in community is the best decision that you'll ever make. And so I want to unpack what it means to do life in community, because that's a bit of, of, a, of a catchphrase or of a statement around here. And so this is what life in community means. It means that you're in relationship with others. And when you're in relationship with others, there's two major types of relationships that we're going to talk about today. And that is a mentorship, and that is an apprenticeship. Now, those two words, mentorship or mentor and apprenticeship or uh, and apprentice, th those two words are, 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 are big words, but let me kind of break down what that means. If, if you're a mentor to somebody, it just means you're one step ahead of the person behind you. I'm constantly pushing our staff. I'm constantly pushing our volunteers and even our elders and leaders to say, hey, who's behind you that you can mentor? And you know what stops us from mentoring people? Is we think, I'm not equipped. I'm not qualified. I can't do that. But I'm telling you, every person in this room and every person watching online is at least one half step ahead of somebody. And with that one step ahead, or even that half step ahead of somebody else, you can turn around and you can actually help them where they are in their life. You, you know what else this, this mentoring does for you? 
this mentoring is so important because when you're this, it brings purpose to the pain. The pain that you dealt with when you experienced life all of a sudden now has purpose because you can take that pain, you can take that situation, you can take that thing that just rocked your world and you can turn around and you can watch somebody else getting ready to walk into the same exact thing or maybe they are going through the same thing and you can actually mentor them and say, hey, let me help you through this. I see this coming down the road for you. Let me just give you a little bit of help. That brings purpose to everything that you've been through. Now, the other relationship is the relationship of an apprentice. This is where you're letting somebody else tell you some good wisdom or some good advice. You know, I've got guys here in this church that I would consider myself an apprentice to. One of them is my good friend Brian Edwards. He's He's a smart, smart, wonderfully wise man, and he gives me advice. Another one is is John Virgo over here. You know, I've I've got all these guys that I try and surround myself with that that they they give me advice and I open up my heart to that advice. I'm their apprentice because I want to learn from them and I want to know what they know. I want to walk into what they've already walked through. In fact, I want to walk through what I'm walking through with the knowledge of what they learned when they walked through it. And so just so that you know that I'm not making this up or I'm not kind of creating this, I want you to understand how created we were to function in these relationships. We were made to click into this kind of relationship model. And I'm going to show you in the Bible a a ton of examples right now of how this relationship was beneficial and how this relationship worked. And so, in Exodus 18, Jethro and Moses. We all know Moses. Do you know who Jethro is? Jethro is Moses' dad. You know what Jethro did? Jethro showed up one day and he said, Moses, I see how you're leading everyone. It's going to burn you out and it's going to destroy you. Instead, you need to lead people this way. You're going to split these people up and you're going to put leaders over them and over them and over them. And Jethro helped Moses lead the people of Israel with his mentorship. And Moses was an apprentice. Okay, so now we can look at Deuteronomy 31 and 34. And I've put these up here so that you can look these up yourself. Deuteronomy 31 and 34. Moses and Joshua. Now Moses is the mentor. Guess who's the apprentice? Joshua. What happens when Moses, who's taking the Israelites out into the promised land, when Moses passes away, Joshua takes over. Joshua moves from apprentice to mentor, but Joshua steps into leadership because of the mentorship that he got from Moses. This relationship works. It works over and over and over again. What about 1 Kings 19 and 2 Kings 2? We see it again with Elisha and Elijah. I don't know why God named these two people something so similar because it's nearly impossible to keep it straight. But Elijah was the mentor. He was a prophet. He was someone that God had said, I'm going to use you to speak through the people, to, to speak to the people. And so God spoke through Elijah. And then there's this amazing story about Elijah where he doesn't actually die. God calls him up into heaven. And as God calls him up, Elisha, his apprentice, says, I want what Elijah had, but I want a double portion of it. And God gave it to him. So here, mentorship and apprenticeship. What about Ruth? There's a book in the Bible called Ruth, chapters 1 through 4. And when you look there, you see this relationship between a woman named Naomi and a woman named Ruth. Naomi was was a mom, and and Ruth was her daughter-in-law. Naomi loved Ruth, and Ruth would not leave Naomi. She could have left Naomi, but she would not. As a daughter-in-law, she stuck by her side, and she learned everything she could. And what Naomi does is Naomi guides Ruth in how to live within the culture of the Israelites because they moved to a new place and Ruth is way out on her own and Naomi walks her through it and guides her through it. And we can look in Luke chapter 1. You've got this relationship between Elizabeth and Mary. Okay, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Elizabeth, one that, that we don't all know as much about, was the mother of John the Baptist. Well, Elizabeth mentored Mary. When Mary came to Elizabeth and said, this crazy weird thing has happened, I'm pregnant, but me and Joseph, like, we didn't actually do it, but I'm pregnant, and I don't understand how that is. And Elizabeth, who had been pre-filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke to Mary, mentored Mary, gave Mary some advice. And, And you find that 
That's in, in Luke chapter 1. Come on, guys, next slide. Next slide. I've got another one for you. Acts 4, 9, and 11, you've got Barnabas and Paul. When Paul was first Saul, Saul was going around and persecuting people that were a member of the way, which is what they called the people, what we would consider like Christians. And when Paul had this, when Saul had this incredible encounter with Jesus, this incredible encounter on, on the Damascus Road, God changed him, and Saul became Paul. And then guess what? Everyone was afraid of Paul except Barnabas. And Barnabas started mentoring Paul. And what would come out of that is Paul would become one of the greatest just missionaries that the world would ever know. In fact, the majority of your New Testament was written by Paul. Paul took the Bible to everyone, to the Gentiles, to everyone. That came because Barnabas took some time to mentor him. How about another one? Acts 16, Philippians 2, and 1st and 2nd Timothy. Paul now decides, I'm going to be a mentor to this young man named Timothy. Timothy's going to be my apprentice. And Paul mentors Timothy so that when Paul could no longer go out to the churches, then guess what? He sent Timothy with him. Now, I, I'm not going to go through these verses, but, but put these on the screen, guys. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, this is in the Old Testament where, where they're actually, the Israelites are instructed how to teach their children and their households how to love God. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, this is where Jesus says, that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and to love others. You get Proverbs 27, 17. That's the verse about iron sharpens iron. See, I want you to understand that this is not me just trying to sell you on a fluffy idea. This isn't me just trying to, trying to say, well, I've got this creative sermon idea, so I'm going to teach this to you guys. No, no, no. This is in the Bible. And I put this up here because if you want to test it, test it. Take a picture of it. Take it home. Open it up. Read it for yourself. But listen, this model works. Life in community works. Mentorship and apprenticeship works. Sharing your life with someone else works. You will not find anyone in this list that I just gave you that suffered for being a mentor or that did not benefit for being an apprentice. Not a single person was made worse for it. In fact, they were all made better for it see this this is why i want you to choose this i want you to choose to do life with others so desperately and so bad because i know that it works wherever you are in your life life can be better when you do it with someone else life can be better when we do life together and so as a church we we really want to put our money where our mouth is. Not only do we want to talk the talk, but we also want to walk the walk. And so we've got a couple things coming up. And, th and again, th this, it's important for you to understand this. This sermon is not a promo for a couple events that we have coming up in the next couple weeks. What it is, is, is I fully believe that God wants to ignite in the heart of this church a sense of community that Cape Town has never seen. I believe that out of South Point Church that we have such an amazing group of people here that we can make it impossible to have a flat tire in Cape Town. We can make it impossible to be sick and not be brought a meal in Cape Town. We can make it absolutely impossible for you to be down, for you to disappear, for you to just kind of pull yourself into your room and, and not come out. And I, wanna, I want it to be po impossible for you to be left alone. I want somebody calling you somebody looking for you, somebody caring for you. That's what happens when we do life together, when we do life in community. And I've seen that power because I've seen how it impacted Casey and I in our life. And I want it to happen in your life. Listen, the southern suburbs is a special place. It's a wonderful place. But it can also at times be a bit closed off. Guys, let's open up. Let's do life together. Let's do life together. In community and so I want to tell you about three things that we're doing and we're doing these out of response to what God is doing in you I come here on Sunday and I see what God is doing in all of you so you guys sit out there and you watch me but I sit up here and I watch you and I see your faces 
And you know what happens when I see your faces? I see your uniqueness, and I see the opportunity that's in you. And sometimes I wish I could just say your name more. I, I wish I could call you out, but I know that I'll make you a bunch of you just feel like self-aware or insecure. But when I see you, I see what God's doing out there. I see what God's doing over here on this side of the room in worship. I see what God's doing back towards the back door as, as Carla takes care of people while they come and go. I, I see what God is doing in, in Tulani as him and Isaac are, are working with our youth and actually bringing live music in transit. See, I see what God is doing in this church. And I tell my staff, I say, if we don't get ready for what God is doing with these people, with you, then we as a church are going to miss it. Because God's moving, whether we're there or not. God's moving in you. God's moving in this church. And so I thought, I need a bucket that can catch the blessing that God is pouring out on every single one of you. And so this is me trying to catch it for you. This bucket, I'm just reacting to what God is doing. I'm not trying to inspire you. I'm trying to be reactionary to what God is doing in you. So you guys don't know it, but you're already doing it. I love when I walked out of church last week and I walked into the, the foyer and I looked around and I thought, what on earth? How did this many people get out here? But it was amazing. It felt incredible because people were connecting. And so the bucket that we've built to try and catch you, to try and catch the grace, to try and catch the blessing that's coming out of your lives as you open up and do life in community, it's, it's three things. The first thing is a WhatsApp number. Now, they're going to put this number on here. Why, why is it? We all, listen, I'm in 10,000 WhatsApp groups, and I hate them all. Okay? And if you're part of one of those groups, I want you to know. I hate your group. Stop sending messages. Okay? But what we're doing with this is we're, we're doing a broadcast list. Listen, you only get a message from us if you, if you put this number in your cell phone. Uh, that, that's the way you're going to get it. That's the way a broadcast list works. But I, I constantly sit with, do you know how many times that we have good news that we want to share and someone says, well, my email went to spam or I didn't get this or I didn't get that. But what's the one platform that is just so reliable? It's WhatsApp. The world runs on it. And so we just want to be a part of that. We, we want to use this so that no, none of you miss what God is doing. We just want to equip you with the ability to see what South Point Church is doing, what announcements are coming up, what events are coming up. That's all that this is. In fact, Smiley's going to start uh, picking little bits out of the service and out of worship and putting them on here. Wouldn't it be great to get a segment of night of worship just come through and, and be an encouragement to you? And like the lady said, you can interact with us. It's a real phone. There's a real person behind it. So that's one way that we're trying to reach out to you. The next two ways are, are this. We've got two initiatives. Next in life and community. Listen. This next, you guys are pushing me. You guys are growing. There's a, there is a, a emerging church growing up out of you. There's so many new people here that, that those that have been part of the furniture for so many years are saying, I don't know who all these people are. Well, you know what we're doing? We're, we're doing a thing to sort that. If you're new, if you don't know South Point or you, you've just started coming, th this is your opportunity to do two things. One... You're going to get to know me. You're going to get to know South Point Church. We're just going to talk to you about who we are, what makes us tick, and what makes us different. And I won't tell you a lot about, I'll tell you more about the church than myself because I think, I think you'll stick with that a bit better. But that, then the second part of next is we give you an ability to take a spiritual gift assessment. Hey, you ever wonder just what your giftings are, what your personality is? Like, you may find out that, hey, actually, turns out I really love this, this, or this, and we can actually pair you with that. So if you're bored and you're looking for a way to act in your giftings, you're looking for a way to get involved, then this is the perfect thing for you to do. I, I want the whole church to come to Next on February 13th at 5 p.m. And in fact, I'll share a success story. This morning, we had a brand new person doing guest services, a man named Ricardo. 
Ricardo is invited to church. He's been coming to church for a little while. And this morning, for the first time, he jumped out and he took on guest services all by himself. You know what? That's amazing because we found a man that has a passion for others. And then we said, Ricardo, we want to give you an opportunity to walk in that passion. And he's doing it. And he walked around like a deer in headlights, but also extremely happy this morning. That was an exciting thing. The next thing that we're doing is life in community. February 20th. Now, I tried to be clever here. If you come, follow me here, a little bit of humor in this. If you come to next and you wonder what's the next thing for me to do, we literally scheduled the next Sunday to be the next thing for you to do. And that's life in community. What is life in community? We all know the term small groups. We all know the term like group life, home group, small group. You know what? That's just a portion of what it is to do life in community. And so on this night, we're launching all of our initiatives for community, all of our affinity groups, all of our Bible studies, all of our small groups. We're going to tell you everything that you need to know about that. And so if you do these two things right here, you will never be more plugged into anything else in your life. And wouldn't it be good to be plugged into and connected to a whole bunch of people in this room? I think that that may be the best thing ever. Listen, you guys, Casey and I, we love you so much. We care so much about you. I think about you all week, every week. We pray for you. Our heart goes out to you. Our heart breaks for you. Our heart celebrates with you. And I want nothing more than for you to have somebody else in your life to do community with. We're taking away the box. We're taking the community out of the, well, you have to do a life group box. And we're just letting it be whatever it needs to be. Because our goal and our value is one thing and one thing only. And it's that we want you doing life with someone else. No matter what that is or no matter what that looks like. And so as the band comes out, they're going to sing another song. And again, this is a moment where I just ask before we go out there and before we... we have coffee and tea and before the day gets busy and before things get going I want you to go back and think about your name and I want you to think about what's associated with your name and I want you to think about what you hope to be associated with your name and then I want you to take a moment don't be awkward or don't be weird but I just want you to glance around the room during this worship song and I want you to see that there's 150 people in this room that you can do life with, that can be that help, that, that can be that community, that can help you so that we can all be and aspire to the people that we actually want to be. And so I'm going to pray for us, and after I pray for